Good morning. Good morning. Hi. I'd like to welcome JC with Carraza. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm so excited to be here at Global AppSec. Uh, it's a very nice event, and, and I'm glad to be here also speaking about Corasa. So today we are going to talk about web application firewalls revisited with uh, OWASP Corasa, right? Let me introduce myself. I am Jose Carlos Chavez. I am I work as a software engineer, security software engineer at Okta. Um, I am Peruvian. I am an open source enthusiast, a loving father of two, and I am a co-leader for the OWASP Corasa project. So, what is a web application firewall? Which uh, you might know, but let's let's get some refresh to get some context <laughs> where we are going to. So, a WAF is a proxy-based tool that inspects HTTP traffic, right? Incoming and outgoing HTTP traffic. So, this happens at L7 in the OC model, right? Um, it analyzes traffic, uh, for looking for malicious and unwanted content, right? From from attackers or, or at least suspicious activities. Um, and they, it attempts to block requests and responses accordingly, right? It can be based on predefined rules, like, uh, for example, the, the core rule set, which is a, a well-known project from, from OWASP. Um, this, uh, and those rules are supposed to describe well-known attacks, right? Um, narrowed down to uh, general attacks, um, SQL attacks, or SQL injection attacks, cross-site scripting, and then you can still narrow down to more popular platforms. Um, and it produces audit logs, right? Because we all uh, need audit logs for, for forensics and, and, and for historical data as well. And for every request that matches the rule, you will get an audit log. And for every rule that was matched, um, you will basically get information about the offending um, input for further analysis. Like, it depends on what do you do uh, with, with the logs afterwards, right? You can either process them, you can apply machine learning algorithms, you can just decide to have historical data there and never look at it again, which I don't recommend, um, or um, reactively apply new policies based on that. So why using a WAF, right? Um, well, there are several um, reasons for using a WAF. Uh, main is that, or the first one is that request response inspection will avoid zero day attacks, right? Client, client side attacks, bot attacks, right? Like, I, I think everyone remembers like the log for shell attack that, that had um, open source contributors or operators working really hard um, out of nowhere. Um, because it provides security rules, or it, uh, it's able to execute security rules, right? For SQL injection, for cross-site uh, scripting attacks, for local or remote file inclusion, size restrictions, all these kind of well-known attacks that we have. Anomaly scoring, um, basically not every um, attack attempt generates the, the same level of uncertainty or the same level of deviation from, from the typical payload. So, what you will be doing with a WAF is like you will be inspecting different aspects of the request, like grabbing the context, and then on every single offending thing, you will give them a score, and then based on different thresholds, you can decide whether to block it or not, right? Um, another important uh, feature is the virtual patching, right? Which we talk about, like how, for example, Amazon um, sorted out the log for shell so quickly, right? It was not because they could patch every single application running log for shell or upgrading every single application running log for shell, because it's up to to builders. It was mainly because it could patch it at network level, right? Saying like, okay, this is the pattern for the offending um, um, traffic. Let's block it at HTTP level. Uh, and that helps you to avoid risk on, on disclosed CVEs, on zero-day vulnerabilities, for example. And then because it will produce audit logs, as I said, for security analysis, for forensics, for compliance. But really, why using a WAF in 2024, right? Because back in the days, WAF were very popular, right? You just put a WAF in front of another WAF and then you feel more safe. Nowadays, it's different, like security has changed. There are different, uh, um, the, the surface of attacks are different. Like there are different inputs for attacks. Like 
Before you had a centralized thing that you could cover with the uh, perimeter security. Now you have cloud, you have multi-cloud, you have um, serverless, you have uh, artif uh, like artifact artifact registries, um, several things, several points of failure. Uh, and then, although um, you cannot be benefited from perimeter uh, security anymore, it can be part of our sec uh, a better cybersecurity uh, defense strategy. So. Some of the of the things that you might get benefit from using a WAF in 2024 is zero trust, for example. Zero trust is the pattern. Well, zero trust actually means zero implicit trust, right? There is an implicit zone where you trust the the um, let's say the users or, or the incoming traffic, uh, and there is a zone which you don't. And and the thing with zero trust is that now the the no non trust zone is not longer your perimeter, right? It's now it is like even uh, you could consider that the attacker is already inside your network. So the zero trust tells us like, okay, create your security policies, like design your security posture as if the attacker is already in your system, right? So you should be able to protect every single workload as if they were exposed to the public. Not maybe not to the same degree of or not to the same um, variety of attacks, but still with the same uh, spirit. Uh, lift and shift, right? Now we, we want to move the secure, uh, like legacy applications into cloud, for example. But you don't want to touch it. You don't want to rebuild it. You don't want to create a new image. So you move it as it is. But then you move, along with the artifact, you move all the vulnerabilities that exist already. So the way to protect them is to put a WAF in front of them, right? Because then you will be able to um, protect the application without changing it. Um, because of PCI DSS 4.0 compliance that is going to be enforced uh, next year, uh, which requires you to have a WAF as a part of a broader strategy for security. Then a WASP top 10, of course, which I um, deliberately put it in here with no more explanation because although you might think like, yeah, but a WASP top 10 is mainly about Bola, authorization, authentication, and more so if you look at the, not the was top 10 for web, but the was top 10 for API. Like, it's, it's all about, like, business logic, right? Which AWAF cannot do much about it because, like, uh, we, we cannot control whether user A can query a product B, right? But, surprisingly, the biggest hack of 2023 was a SQL injection. So WAF is still relevant. It's still needed. Like, Maybe it's not the only, the, the main, um, or, or the only one single point of failure, but it should be part uh, as, uh, of a broader strategy, different layers of security, right? Um, in life, we like to say, like, less is more. In security, less is less, and more is more. So the more layers of security that you have, the better security posture you will have. And again, as I said, like, we will have a robust cybersecurity program because we will cover different aspects of the attack surface for your applications, right, with a WAF, along with fine grinded access control, along with VPNs, along with um, having a Cloudflare in front, a DNS, or different kind of things. Then let me introduce Corasa WAF, which some of you might know about. But uh, this this talk is about the, the this this wonderful project that we have been working on for for some years now. What is Corasa WAF? Well, it's an open source web application firewall, right? In the in the times of proprietary WAFs, like there are probably um, the eighty five percent of the WAFs out out there are proprietary. Uh, we have an open source WAF. It's written in Go. Um, it was initially inspired in mode security. Uh, actually, the idea originally was to be a drop-in replacement. At some point, we decided to take our own path, still supporting set lang. It's focused on the WASP core rule set, B4 in this case, which is the de facto standard for rule sets um, when it comes to WAFs, to, right? Um, and, and the version 3, it got the production flag from OWASP, so it's been recommended to use in production. Um, we are currently version 3.2.1, which was released like a few days ago. We are 2K in GitHub, so it's, it's a good thing. What are the core principles of Corasa? Well, the first one is sustainability, 
right? We want to build a community. We want to build a project that can be sustained beyond individuals, beyond companies. Um, as you can tell I started working in Coraza when I was working at the trade. Uh, I don't work at the trade anymore. Still, I contribute to Coraza. Um, and some other peps are still working in Coraza while they are not, it's not part of their day to day job. It's just because we like the project, because we, we, um, believe in the project, right? Also, we have, a, um, we, we have developed relationship with different, um, let's say, uh, friend projects or friend companies to be able to still push in this, um, ecosystem forward. Um, we have, uh, for example, a really good relationship with Traffic, which is the, the newest, uh, let's say, project that adopted Coraza as the WAF solution. But there are others that are uh, still using Coraza and we still keep a good relationship with. So we have, uh, we, we, we started having these principles like, okay, we, although there are people from the same company in the project you cannot uh, things like you cannot approve pr from the same uh, from from a pair from the same company because we want like a heterogeneous enough ecosystem and heterogeneous enough policies so we we don't build a waf for this company right we build a waf for general purpose um it's mainly built of built on use cases like every time someone uh, creates an issue in Corasa, we will ask what's the use case behind it and it's just the first step. It doesn't mean that we're going to implement it. It means like we will collect in use case and we can maybe connect this new issue with another issue that already exists. And then we, we find finally a match because like you request the feature, right? Uh, and, and we put implementation most likely. Then uh, API stability and extensibility. We, we have um, several discussions about how we can uh, address the, the API stability. Um, because, um, when we were working on V3, it was really easy to introduce breaking changes because uh, it, there was a lot of opportunities to do cool stuff with Rasa, but we decided to keep an, an stable API like that uh, users can't rely on. Uh, but still, we wanted to, to leave some room for experimentation or, or for extensions. So we provide also experimental APIs, an experimental package, which is supposed to change. But then it em uh, helps people or, or embraces extensibility and em embraces experiments, right? Um, ideally, we want to, the use case to be built towards our experimental API before we can put in the core, right? And not the other way around. Um, we target an another important aspect about Coraz, and I think this was the original that deviated the, the path uh, Coraza following mod security was that we were targeting different runtimes and environments. Um, we didn't want to be constrained only to, for example, Go, which is the, the language where Coraza is written, but we wanted also to be in every other um, application, despite whether they run in a proxy or they run in the application itself, or even when they run in the browser. Um, so that, that was a first-class concern. We started with WebAssembly, um, which is portable, uh, um, let's say, uh, native performance-ish code mm -hmm. that you can run in different platforms. That was the, the original case for for targeting different runtimes and environments. Uh, and then we started, like, you know, building our own strategy to conquer the world, let's say, in in, in different languages. And uh, we are also very focused on performance and high throughput. Like we provide several uh, benchmarks that we run, and, and basically in every other change we we bear in mind and performance. We 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 run profiling, we run benchmarks, and and we care a lot about it because if we want a WAF like this to run in the critical path because of things like zero trust, for example, if I want to inspect all the traffic from even workloads in the same network. Um, and we are in the hot path, we want to be performed and we want to allocate the less memory possible and all that. Um, so these are the API features that we have. Um, as I said, um, we support plugins, um, actions, transformations, operators, audit loggers, body processors. They all can be extended programmatically through our experimental API. The reason for this was that we, at the beginning, for example, we were, we were unsure about, okay, what makes us different from, from mod security? We had lots of features from mod security, but we, we wanted to also put your, our own signature on them. 
So we said like, okay, we, we, we should be able to extend this and, and support different, um, new operators, different new audit loggers in a way that people can write their own. And that's how we started with this experimental API. Um, several things have, have been built on, on top of them nowadays. For example, last Google Summer of Code, someone brought a rate limiter, pure rate limiter based on Corasa plugins. Um, audit loggers, we, we provide, uh, now we are about to support um, the OSCF uh, format for audit loggers through the experimental API before we can incorporate into the main package. Body processor for different formats because uh, we know that the de facto is JSON, but why do we con why do we restrict ourselves to JSON, right? Um, if someone wants to try a different, uh, like XML or whatever, maybe um, data, data pack or protobufs, like, let's then write them. We have multi-platform connectors, and this is an interest interesting part. Um, you can run Corasa in native Go. That's for sure, because we are a Go library. Um, but you can also run it in Kadi, which is, um, again, it's Go, but, but still you have to recompile it. We also target hub proxy, and we lately targeted uh, traffic. In traffic, there are two ways you can run Corasa. One is you can write it natively in Go, or you can write it through WebAssembly, right? So we compile the uh, a Corasa middleware into WebAssembly, and then you can load it to, from through traffic uh, and run it. We target Envoy, Istio, Kong, and API 6. Um, they all use in proxy wasm expect. Um, this is again WebAssembly. Um, but if you look at Envoy, Istio, and Kong, um, they, they, like, Envoy is written in C++, um, and basically it loads through a virtual machine the binary that we deliver and run it, right? But it has nothing to do with Go. And again, it's fully compatible with web, with web, uh, web assembly, right? On web assembly, yeah, we can say like it allows to run Corasa in a very variety of stacks through WASM runtime. For example, as I said, um, Envoy is C++, but our Corasa playground, <laughs> given that we are a security project, we didn't want to have a server to protect, right? So we run it in the browser as if it will run in your server. Um, you can leverage Corasa as part of a policy enforcement point, right? If you hear of zero trust deployments like Sidecar, for example, like in Service Mesh, then you can leverage Corasa in the Sidecar, right? Um, and, and uh, yeah, for, for Service Mesh based systems. Um, you can allow, it allows to choose libraries on different languages based on its performance. And this is a, a very interesting use case because, for example, when we were writing or, or compiling Corasa for Envoy, um, we realized that the Go native um, regular expression uh, library was very slow. So we look beyond and we look at RE2, for example, which is a C++ library. And then we made it uh, compile into a binary that we will link statically and then deliver in the WebAssembly binary. So we have better performance um, for regexes. And, it's, uh, and the, the funny part is that that was even like compiling re RE2 into and, and then linking it statically was much more, perf and running over WebAssembly was much more performant than um, the standard library for regexes in Go. Um, same for, for um, the dictionary algorithm, Aho Korasic. We, we run a Rust version that we compile into WebAssembly and that we run it through Wasero. So, so yeah, that all, all these kind of things um, shows how obsessive are we about performance, right? That we could um, even go beyond and link. Um, and by the way, when I say link statically, that doesn't mean that you have to do anything. You just consume a library that already has statically linked um, the library compiled from other language. So you still in Go, but the runtime is different, let's say. And it promotes portability and distribution of Corasa as a wide organization policy, right? Without requir requiring application changes. And this is specifically targeting service mesh, for example. You can leverage Corasa um, in the sidecar and then nobody has to change anything. You just run your normal application, but we put a middleware in front of it that you wouldn't notice. Uh, this is why we, we did a big bet on, on WebAssembly because it, it leveraged all these use cases. So, what's next for Corasa? 
Well, um, we want to expose our directives API so people can build their own directives. This is especially important for, um, let's say, more, more sophisticated plugins. Like, for example, the GeoLib plugin requires um, their own directives. We support them. But uh, I don't, we don't want that every time there is a good use case, we have to add a dire directive in the code, right? We want uh, to have a directives API that people can create their own directives and can leverage their own directives without changing the core. We want the, we are, we are uh, bringing the OSF, o OSCF format, ex export format, which is basically the format written uh, or, or created at AWS for security events. Um, we currently have our own format for JSON and we also support the legacy format from mod security. Um, we are not sure about like both of them making sense. So following a standard is much better, right? That's why we, we are leveraging that. Uh, we want paranoia levels as first class uh, APIs. Uh, for the sake of performance at the beginning, but in the end for the sake of extensibility, right? Um, we want more rigex support for variables, like for different directives, for CTL, for sec response body MIME type. So you can do, you can cover more use cases. We want more connectors. Um, we want uh, the, the ones that we have. We want, we, we are looking for a partnership with existing platforms. We don't want to maintain ourselves just ourselves with, for example, what is working now with traffic is that they are maintaining parts of the connector and we are maintaining other parts. And I think that that makes the ecosystem um, sustainable. And uh, we are looking for the same with other connectors. And uh, the next big thing is that we go in probably in the next version in one, 123 is going to support a compilation of Go code into WebAssembly through Go compiler which brings a lot new set of tools like the garbage collector from Go, because right now we um, implement our own, our, our own garbage collector in, in Corasa Proxy Wasm and because of performance again. <laughs> but now that Go is going to support that, we can use the, the bulletproof, battle-tested garbage collector from Go. So that's going to be a big thing as well for, for Corasa and WebAssembly. So yeah, that's it. Thank you. If you have uh, questions, I'm happy to reply. Otherwise, there is a set of references that you can read to learn more about Corasa, web application firewalls, and why not core rule set. Thank you.